Welcome to the Charlotte Wildlife Stewards May program. Uh, we are a chapter of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, which is affiliated with the National Wildlife Federation. You can see on the screen our email address and our website. We also can be found on social media. This is the um, last program of this year. We typically have our program September through May. We'll be starting up again next September, uh, whether we'll be online again or in person or a hybrid. We're going to be figuring that out this summer. So we hope that you will join us in whatever format we are. Just a few housekeeping um, comments. Uh, you are already on mute um, and we would like you to stay on mute during the presentation. If you have a question, you can put it in the chat box or you can raise your hand. One, our goal is to connect people with nature and we do that through our mission to create, and preserve, to create, preserve and protect wildlife habitat through education, engagement and enjoyment. We really love getting people outside and having fun doing it. One of the ways that you can help wildlife is to create a wildlife habitat. This, this is a Garden for Wildlife Month that's sponsored by the National Wildlife Federation. And to promote that, they're offering a 20% off the certification fee. So you'd be paying $16 rather than 20. And then their signs are on sale off also. When you create a habitat, um, the elements that are needed are food. You can see right here, it's food, water, a place to raise your young, shelter, and sustainable practices. Um, it, there's a good chance you already have these in your yard. Go ahead and check out um, nwf.org certified wildlife habitat and they will guide you through the process of certifying your habitat. Charlotte has over 1400 wildlife habitats right now and you know we like to see that keep growing and the other thing is that Charlotte has been recertified as a wildlife habitat community and having these wildlife habitats is one of the keys in that. How can you become involved with our chapter? You can volunteer at our events and we hope in the fall that we'll be having a big event I'll talk about later. Um, you can participate in our events, just come and enjoy them. You can join our chapter. You could join a committee in our chapter. Uh, we have lots of opportunities or you can become a member of the leadership team and help with planning our activities. Another way you can help is to donate. We are a, a nonprofit organization totally dependent on donations in order to fulfill our mission. And if you and you could also become a corporate sponsor if that's uh, in your power to do that. When you join Charlotte Wildlife Stewards, you're also joining the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. And with that, you get a monthly wild, wild wildlife wire that comes in your email. There's a quarterly North Carolina Wildlife Federation journal with good articles in it. We occasionally have members only events. In the past, we've gone kayaking on Mountain Island Lake and we've had behind the scene tours at the Raptor Center, which are only available to our members. You get the opportunity to network with other nature lovers and other chapters. We, we do activities with our sister chapters. You also get bragging rights that you're a member of this great organization. In order to join, you do go through the North Carolina Wildlife Federation website and you would click on join or renew and there is a box where you would click your chapter. So make sure you choose Charlotte Wildlife Stewards. We do have some sponsors uh, who are very generous. Wild Birds Unlimited in Charlotte and Honeybee Real Estate have been instrumental in helping us carry out our mission. And we want to point that out and to thank them. So we have a few events coming up. Um, there's currently one going on called the uh, North Carolina Wildlife Federation Neighborhood Cleanup Challenge. This is a part of their Trees for Trash program. I don't know if any of you have participated in this before, but it's, it's a great way to clean up your neighborhood and to help protect wildlife and the environment. Basically, you go out and you pick up trash and on um, the um, 
Facebook, there is a Facebook event post about this. There's a link where you can report in what you've picked up for every 25 pounds of trash that is collected and reported in. North Carolina Wildlife Federation will plant a native tree or shrub in North Carolina. Our next event, which thankfully is an in-person event we're able to have because it's outside, it will be our I Spy Nature Walk. We'll be at the Chantilly Ecological Sanctuary. This was an area that's been, nature is reclaiming thanks to uh, stormwater services. They purchased this land and have been restoring it and we helped them out with, with putting in eight birdhouse boxes a few weeks ago. So we hope, it's probably too late this year, but we hope next year we'll have some new residents out there. But that's on Sunday, May 16th at 3 p.m. We'll be gathering at the, at the Chantilly Neighborhood Park to begin our journey. Our group book read for this month has been Silent Spring, which ties in with our program topic for today. Another event that we're having is our Wild on the Water, Wild in the Woods fundraiser. It's very different from the past years that we've had because we can't have our big in-person event. So we're going to have it as a virtual event where you, you sign up to participate, get, spot, get people, to, your friends and neighbors to sponsor you for however many hours you're out on the water or in the woods. And then that's, that comes in as a donation to Charlotte Wildlife Stewards. So we're hoping um, that you will participate in that this year. The other big event that we're going to have in September, and this is, of course is all pending the situation with COVID, but we're planning it now, is Kids Nature Day. It'll be on Sunday, September 19th at Reedy Creek Park. We're gonna have lots of partner organizations there with hands-on activities. It, it's called Kids in Nature Day, but it's for kids of all ages. So I hope that you'll go ahead and put that on your calendar and look for more information as we put that out. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Ernie McLaney, who's gonna introduce our speaker for tonight. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Ernie McLaney, one of the uh, leadership team members for Charlotte Wildlife Stewards. Um, Sydney Ross is a pesticide operations specialist for the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services Structural Pest Control and Pesticides Division. Long title. She's out of Raleigh. Before becoming a pesticide specialist, she worked as a pesticide inspector for that department for two and a half years. In her current position, she feels complaints from the public about pesticides. She delegates inquiries to the department's uh, legal team, and she also is a data steward for the field watch program. She may get into that some later. Sydney works for the enforcement end of things and her department deals with regulating the pest control industry which specifically deals with outdoor use and may address the mosquito treatments commercial applica applicators make. Though Sydney is able to talk about some of the chemicals used and a bit about how they work and reporting on uh, the complaints and violations, she's not a toxicologist and therefore she will not or cannot really speak on the broader environmental fates of pesticides. For those questions, our chapter will be emailing you each a couple of copies of handouts which can address uh, some of those other issues for you if you don't hear about them here. So Sydney, we thank you for your work throughout the state to keep an eye on the regulation and enforcement of commercial use of pesticides. We appreciate your time in putting this program together for our audience. And I'll remind folks to please keep yourself muted. If you have a question, you can type it into the chat. It's possible that Sydney will answer your question uh, a little bit later in her presentation. Um, so if you can type it in there, Tara or Donna will probably read it uh, at the end and we'll do what we can to answer your questions. So thanks for joining us, everyone. And Sydney, we'll turn it over to you now. Mr. McLaney, I really appreciate that great intro. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here, so bear with me for just one moment. And let me know if you're able to see everything OK. I guess with a, a verbal OK would be great. <laughs> yes, it looks great. Wonderful. Thanks, Tara. So um, 
like Ernie said, my name is Sydney Ross. I work for the Department of Agriculture's Pesticide Section. Um, we have two different sort of sections within our division. The full title, of course, is our Structural Pest Control and Pesticides Division. And broadly, our department deals with regulating pesticides and um, specifically pest control applicators in both the outdoor and indoor spheres. Today I'm going to be giving you um, sort of a brief overview of the mosquito application industry. So my goal of this presentation is to kind of arm you with information so that you know way more about mosquito applications than you did previously. Some of the stuff I'm going to be talking about, we're going to go over just some broad stuff about what a pesticide is, also what our department specifically does. We're going to talk a little bit about mosquito biology, who makes mosquito applications, and the types of different control that we see in mosquito applications. We're also going to talk about how commercial applicators choose a product. We're going to go over pesticide labels, some commonly used products that are used by those in the mosquito application industry. We're going to talk very briefly about toxicity. We're also going to talk a little bit about mosquito application regulations and common violations that I see that come across my desk. And at the very end, we're going to cover some myths and facts that I hear over the phone all the time from members of the public just giving me a call. In terms of, you know, kind of a broad day to day, what do I do? So um, like Mr. McLaney said, I used to be in the field as a pesticide inspector. I covered the center part of the state and then they promoted me into the office. And now I answer all of the complaint calls in the state about outdoor use of pesticides. So as you can imagine, I hear a bunch of different things, everything from, you know, just what is that guy spraying at the house next door to me, all the way up to pesticide spills and poisonings. So it really is a very broad kind of range of complaints that I get. And I'll talk to you a little bit specifically through the lens of mosquito application about some of those complaints today. So we'll start here just very basic. What is a pesticide? So according to our North Carolina Pesticide Law of 1971, which is sort of our overarching law that we've adopted in the state that kind of gives us all of our laws about pesticides as sort of a base starting point. A pesticide is any substance or mixture of substances intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating a pest. You can imagine that I probably have this one memorized after talking to people about it in the field for a few years. But it's also important to remember that pest is a subjective term. So something that could be a pest to me might not be a pest to somebody else. For example, you know, um, clover is a great example because some people view clover as a weed and they want to get it out of their lawns, but maybe people who are promoting pollinator habitat realize that clover is a great resource for bees and pollinators who are foraging, so they'll actually leave clover alone. And it's important to kind of remember this when we consider what a pesticide is as well. And one thing that was mentioned on the flyer, which I really appreciated, is that pesticide is kind of an umbrella term and it houses any mixture of those substances that intend to kill any type of a pest. So this could be herbicides, fungicides, rodenticides, defoliants, desiccants, plant growth regulators. These are all pesticides, although generally I think that when people use the word pesticide, they're referring more to insecticides. Just remember that this is kind of an overarching term. So specifically, our department is tasked with regulating the pest control and pesticide industries through enforcement of laws and regulations. You just heard me mention the North Carolina Pesticide Law of 1971, which is again kind of a, what was adopted um, by the General Assembly of North Carolina in 1971 as a starting place for us to build laws regulating pesticides in our state. Um, over the years, of course, this document has been edited and revised. And then beyond that, we also have a secondary place where we get our regulations from. This comes from the North Carolina's Administrative Code Food and Drug Protection Division's regulations. Our department used to be housed inside of Food and Drug, which is the reason why there's still regulations housed within that document. But specifically, if you're looking for pesticide regulations, it's going to be subchapter 9L. And I have links here. I'll certainly provide this presentation over, but you can also find these on our website. 
later on in the presentation, I'm going to go through some kind of common violations and where they actually come from in the law. That way you can see for yourself where we get those violations from. In terms of, you know, the actual functionality of our department, um, we do everything from monitoring field operations of those who are working in the pest control industry and the pesticides industry. So farmers, nursery folks, people who do indoor pest control, um, extermination, things like that. But we also register pesticide products. Um, I, I'll leave a pause here for you to guess how many uh, pesticide products are actually registered each year. Um, it's about 13,000 pesticides registered each year, so it's quite a lot. Um, and beyond that, we also license um, applicators to be certified to apply pesticides. So everybody who applies pesticides on a commercial basis in our state does need to be licensed. Additionally, we also license farmers who are producing a commodity who might be using restricted use pesticides. And in terms of our kind of compliance monitoring, all of those individuals get routinely and randomly inspected. And we have two different levels of inspectors. I'm going to show you some maps here with all of the inspectors on them who will go around and they'll perform these inspections and make sure that people are in compliance. This also includes inspections at mosquito application companies. Our first kind of level of inspector is in the sort of commercial sphere of inspection. I would like to specify at this point too that specifically our department is broken into two sections, so our structural pest control and also our pesticide section. I work for the pesticide section, so I really only deal with outdoor use of pesticides. If you ever have any question about structural pesticides, we can always turn you over to somebody over email as well, but that's really what I'm going to be focusing on today. So like I mentioned, we have about 11 inspectors who are here working in the field for um, commercial type applications. And then we also have inspector two level inspectors and there is about seven of them and they go ahead and they will um, do all of the compliance monitoring for farmers, nursery folks, um, greenhouses. They also do some work with um, producer establishments, so places where they make um, pesticides. So that's kind of who we have out there in the field. This kind of brings us into more of our topic here today, which is mosquitoes. So specifically, I wanted to kind of go over a bit of mosquito biology, just so we can talk a little bit more about how pesticides affect mosquitoes widely. So mosquitoes go through a type of metamorphosis, which is called complete metamorphosis. And what this means is that every stage of their life cycle looks a little bit different than the one before it. Um, in incomplete metamorphosis, um, the insect will hatch out and it almost looks like a tiny version of the sort of adult. In complete metamorphosis, we have um, an egg to a larva, into a pupa, into an adult. So female mosquitoes can lay between, I believe it's about 10 to 100 eggs per cluster. So we're looking at a lot of mosquitoes there. And I'm getting someone who's not on mute there. <laughs> I think maybe we're, we're good now. Um, so generally it will take about 24 hours from that egg to kind of develop into that first larval stage. And then um, depending upon the species, generally mosquitoes will go through four larval stages until they develop into a pupa. And this generally takes about seven or so days. So we're looking at about a week. In terms of the most common species that we have in North Carolina, that would be the Asian tiger mosquito. And commonly we see about four different species of mosquitoes in North Carolina. Um, if you are wondering what stage of mosquito is actually responsible for biting people, that would be the adult female mosquitoes. So those are the ones who actually go out and they do all of the blood sucking and the biting. Male mosquitoes are really only there for the purpose of reproduction, and they actually feed off of the nectar of plants, which I found out while I was researching this and I thought was really interesting. Another thing that I found out was that females can actually, in some species, fly miles away from where they were hatched, so um, they have a fairly good range of where they can go. In terms of who makes mosquito applications, we have everybody from homeowners making applications to their own backyards to our public health departments or municipalities who might be responsible for routine applications of mosquitoes. Sometimes you'll see them driving around with sprayers mounted on the back of 
trucks and they'll be kind of fogging as they go down the street. I know that I hear complaints about that occasionally, so I know it kind of happens here throughout the state. And then we also have public health departments respond to natural disasters. Um, for example, a few years ago when we had Hurricane Florence, um, we were actually called in as sort of um, consultants, I guess you'd say, um, for some different counties. Our pesticide inspectors went out and they were going to decide if they were going to be doing, you know, area wide sprays for mosquitoes and things like that. And then beyond that, we have our commercial applicators. So these are individuals who are paid to make mosquito applications on somebody else's property. And we have commercial applicators in both our structural pest control and our outdoor mosquito companies. And I'm going to get into that a little bit later, just sort of the distinction between those two. I found this uh, map here from 2019, which I thought was pretty cool. It uh, kind of shows the mosquito hot spots um, and you'll notice here that Charlotte and Raleigh Durham are kind of on this map so we are kind of a big one in terms of mosquitoes. In terms of um, mosquito control um, we always like to consider control of any type of pest from an integrated pest management system. Um, integrated Pest Management or IPM is a system in which um, we consider all different types of control not just chemical and it was developed in the 1970s and is thought to be a much more sustainable approach to pest management versus just chemical control. Um, some of the things that specifically affect mosquito control include biological control, so that would be, you know, predators or parasites of mosquitoes. Um, for example, the bat or the little brown bat in North Carolina is a great example of this. We also have physical control. So if let's say you're going outside and you wear some clothing that's protecting you, that's physically controlling you from being bitten by mosquitoes. We have our cultural control, um, which is going to be um, sort of manipulating the environment in order to slow down reproduction or actually stop reproduction or inhibit a pest species from becoming a real issue. Um, you can see here that this is a picture of a gutter. So if you were to, let's say, clean out the leaf litter in your gutter, it would reduce the amount of wet spaces where mosquitoes can reproduce. And then additionally, we have our chemical control, which is kind of the more traditional what we hear about. So that would be application of pesticides. In terms of what we're going to focus on today, I'm going to touch a little bit on cultural control, but I'm also going to talk mainly about chemical control since we are looking at this through a pest control pesticides lens. Back into cultural controls here. So again, this is the practice of reducing pest establishment, reproduction, dispersal, and survival by changing the environment of the pest. Um, I was kind of going into an example where let's say you have a field of grapevines and right next to that grapevine, you notice that there um, is a road and next to the road, all of the grapevines have really bad spider mites. Um, this could be possibly because while people drive down the road, they're actually um, causing some wind and pushing those spider mites up onto those grapevines. A form of cultural control would be to actually wet down that road. That way there isn't any dust or debris flying up as cars drive by. So that's kind of an example of cultural control. Another example would be that's more specific to mosquitoes would be to remove the reproduction start site, thereby removing the pest. So a lot of times what we hear is, you know, avoid standing water in your backyard. Make sure that you don't have any standing water there and you won't have breeding mosquitoes near you. Um, one thing that I thought was just so incredible, um, he is now retired, but um, Dr. Mike Waldvogel is a mosquito um, flea and tick specialist at NC State, um, and he had written this article that um, I linked down here that is a great review of ways to reduce any type of standing water in areas near your home. So this would be, you know, a great thing to check out if you wanted to. But again, you know, avoid standing water in gutters, rain barrels, bird baths, swimming pools, ponds, etc., things like that. Oh, also as a note on the swimming pools, um, if you treat your pool, most likely you probably won't be having any mosquitoes in there. Uh, just a bit of a side note. So this kind of moves us on to what we're mainly going to focus on today, which is chemical control. So chemical control is defined as use of pesticides to control a pest. 
This can be anything from a granular, a liquid, a wettable powder, a dry flowable. But in terms of mosquito applications, we're really only um, seeing in the field granular or liquid applications. Mostly these are applied as a liquid. Um, we have two different types of lip liquid applications that can be used. There's contact in which the applicator will actually spray and it kind of kills the insects that are there. And then there's also residual treatments. So these are where the applicator will spray and that chemical will stay around for multiple months. Um, in terms of the type of spraying that they do, many types of mosquito applications will use what's known as an ultra low volume spray. And this essentially makes that pesticide into a fog, creating very small, fine droplets. I get a lot of calls about this. People are saying, oh, it looks like they're kind of fogging and they're not really sure about that type of an application. I would say this is the most common type of application that we see. In terms of, you know, kind of different types um, specifically of chemical control that we see, there are two that are often seen in mosquito control. We have use of insect growth regulators. Um, what this is, is kind of a way to disrupt the growth cycle of the insect, specifically for um, the chemicals that I have up here, the methoprene and the pyriperoxifen. Um, what these do is actually mimic a hormone in the insect's body and this disrupts the growth cycle. More commonly, we'll see the use of insecticides. I'm sure you're all familiar with what an insecticide is. Um, and we have two different types of insecticides. So there are adulticides, so those that are set to kill adult insects through spraying or fogging, like those liquid apl applications that we talked about. And then there's also larvicides, which are um, going to be products that are applied most of the time to standing water while those insects are in their larval phase, and they will actually kill the mosquito before it can grow into an adult. So an example of this would be mosquito dunks. Some of you might be familiar with those, and if not, we're going to touch base on them in a little bit. So how exactly do applicators choose a pesticide product? Um, most of the time they're going to be kind of thinking about the parameters of a job. So initially they're going to consider the types of applications that would best suit the job and ask themselves questions like, is there a ton of standing water? Is there a large amount of vegetation? What time of year is it? Are we in the beginning of mosquito season or at the very end of mosquito season? How large is the area to be treated and what products are actually available to them? This last one, you know, what products are available to them is going to be a very big determining factor in what products they actually choose to use if they are doing chemical control. And finally, the last thing that I think not many people actually think about, but ultimately it comes down to from a business standpoint, what is the cost on the applicator? So, you know, the cost of labor, how long will it take for them to go out and get that job done? And then beyond that, you know, what is the cost of the chemical? Because pesticides are in fact very expensive. So when we consider a pesticide, and this is kind of the point in which, you know, I'll have you put on your thinking caps and we'll go ahead and go through some things. And this is really going to be, I'd say, your um, biggest um, weapons of knowledge in terms of if you want to know more about pesticide applications. First and foremost, the thing that you want to do is make sure that you know the pesticides label. So go ahead and print it out. If you find out what the pesticide is that somebody's applying near you, go through it with a highlighter. The reason why we want you to kind of take a look at the label is because it's going to tell you more than anything about this pesticide application. It'll tell you the areas in which the pesticide can be applied, how it can be applied, the rate at which it should be applied, um, things to avoid, environmental hazards, um, and more specifically, you know, a lot of people I would say are familiar with our safety data sheet. Um, this mainly will give information about the um, sort of composition of the pesticide as well as toxicology, um, ways to deal with a pesticide spill. There's about 16 different sections, so I won't go through all of them with you. But if let's say you're looking at a pesticide um, from the lens of somebody who wants to do pollinator protection, um, 
the most important parts of the label that you want to check out are the active ingredients. So what is actually doing the killing power? That's going to be our active ingredient. Um, a pesticide is going to be a combination of an active ingredient, that thing that does the killing power, as well as inert ingredients that might act as sort of a um, thing that gets that chemical into solution or a carrier for the active ingredient. Beyond that, we always want to take a look at the signal word. Signal word denotes toxicity. We also want to look at the EPA registration number. This will tell us what specific chemical formulation we have. And the precautionary statement, this will give us information about you know, where that chemical can and can't be applied, what type of um, adverse effects it could have on wildlife. And then finally, the environmental hazards, which again will give us more information about you know, any potential hazards, for example, if it's toxic to invertebrates or fish or if it's harmful towards bees and things like that. So always take a look at that pesticide label. Um, another thing to take a look at if let's say you're coming at it from a pollinator um, protection lens is a bee advisory box. In this last few years, it was mandated that some insecticides should add a bee advisory box to the label. This is what a bee advisory box looks like. It is actually a large portion of that label that will say, hey, there are application restrictions. You know, this product can kill insects. This product can kill pollinators and bees. Um, take a look at this advisory label to find out more about how you can and can't apply this product. So this is a really um, kind of, I'd say, off the bat way to know whether or not a product is going to be harmful to pollinators is if it has this bee advisory box. But it's also a really good tip off to applicators to make sure that they are aware that the product is harmful to insects and pollinators. Um, I did want to mention because Mr. McLaney kind of gave it a shout out earlier, I did not include any information about our field watch program in this um, presentation, mainly because we talk about it quite often. So if you've ever seen a presentation given by somebody from my department, you will have heard about it before. Um, I think this is a good place to kind of tell you what FieldWatch is. Uh, FieldWatch is an online mapping system program where beekeepers, both hobbyist and commercial, can map out their beehives and um, they can go ahead and put them on there so that applicators can log online and see where those beehives are and actually contact that beekeeper so that we can mitigate any potential exposure issues. If let's say you did want more information about FieldWatch, um, I will have my email address at the end of this slide set. So please send me an email and I can certainly give you more information. In terms of other portions of the label that I had mentioned, um, one of those is that environmental hazards statement. So you'll notice here that there are two different statements that we want to look at. The first is that the product is extremely toxic to fish and aquatic invertebrates. So this specific product that we're using as an example should not directly be applied to water. Um, and beyond that, we also have a secondary um, environmental hazard statement here. Do not allow the product to drift to blooming crops if bees are visiting the treatment area. One thing that is very important to note, I'm going to get into a little bit more of it later when I go through common violations in our regulatory capacity as a department, but everything on a pesticide label is the law. We have a regulation in our subchapter 9L that says any deviation from the pesticide label is a violation of the law. Um, the way I like to think about it is every time you purchase a pesticide, you are entering into a contract with our department, the EPA, and the manufacturer of that chemical that says that you will use that chemical, and this is even as a homeowner, not even, you know, just as an applicator, you know, you are going to make sure you follow that label to a T. Uh, I think that a lot of people don't realize this. I can tell you myself that when I was a 17 year old working at a nursery in California, I thought, you know, more is more. And so I'm going to put a little bit more of this pesticide onto a sweet pea and I totally killed it. That was my first uh, time using a pesticide and I did not read the label. Um, I know there's probably a lot of us who are guilty of this. Please read the pesticide label. Um, if not, it never really goes well. You could kill your plant or worse, you know, kill non-target insects or even harm yourself. So definitely check out the pesticide label. So um, we're going to get into a little bit about specific chemicals now. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the most commonly used products by mosquito applicators. 
I'm not going to talk to you too much about method or mode of action for these chemicals, which is actually the way in which they kill insects or specifically mosquitoes, mostly because that can be a little bit complicated and time consuming. So I'm just going to give you kind of a brief overview. Um, some of the most commonly used products that we see, and I've kind of sectioned them off by the type of pesticide that they are. So in sort of our neonicotinoids type, we have imidacloprid. Um, one example of a product that's an imidacloprid product that is used often in mosquito applications is Merit 2F. Um, one thing to know about all of these is that there are so many mosquito products that use these active ingredients. So these are just kind of examples. This isn't a complete list. Beyond that, we have our pyrethroids. This is one that was mentioned in the flyer that was sent out for this presentation. And you'll notice here that there are far more active ingredients in this category. In terms of mosquito applications, almost I would say, you know, maybe 80% of applications are going to be with a product whose active ingredient is a pyrethroid. Um, for those of you are, who are familiar with pyrethrins, this is sort of the chemical defense that is produced by a chrysanthemum when an insect comes to attack it. People were able to um, isolate that and synthesize it, and so they have created a synthetic version of this, which is known as pyrethroids. And these are the basis of some of the chemicals that you see here. Uh, Bifenthrin, I would say, is probably the most commonly used type of active ingredient, but you know, shortly followed by permethrin, lambda cyhalothrin, um, delta methrin, and um, cyfluthrin. So if you see that THRIN or that thrin at the end, you can almost always guess that it is a pyrethroid of some type. And I've added a few different um, products there that you can kind of take a look at as well. Um, beyond that, we also have a few organophosphates. Um, these ones are sometimes noted apart from neonicotinoids as sort of the big bad of pesticide active ingredients or types of pesticides. Um, the two that we have that are commonly used in mosquito application industry is malathion. Most of the time malathion products will actually have malathion in the name, which differs from some of our other um, types of pesticide products. They don't always have the active ingredient in the name. Excuse me. And then the other one that we have here is NALID, or um, they sometimes will call it um, dibrome concentrate as well. Beyond that, we do have a few insect growth regulators. I brought those up earlier. A commonly used um, insect growth regulator is um, S methoprene or um, Altacid. I see this one often when I'm looking at the different applications that people make around the state. And then beyond that, we have pyriperoxifen, which is in Duraflex CS. Um, it seems to me that pyriperoxifen is still kind of a being researched active ingredient. Um, if let's say you were to look up pyriperoxifen um, mosquito control, you'll find quite a few scientific articles. Um, we also recently had a case where somebody used this um, at a nursery where um, they had been producing um, brood for a beehive and it did cause a bee kill. So this is one that certainly is kind of a harmful chemical um, for bees specifically. And then beyond that, we do have some bacterial larvicides as well. These are also termed as bioinsecticides. A lot of these will um, use a specific bacterial strain in order to actually predate the large larval um, the larval stages of mosquitoes. So that's really interesting. Um, these are also credited with, with oftentimes being a bit more specific to the pest insect that they're actually looking to kill. Um, so one that's really common is Bacillus thuringiensis. Specifically, the um, subspecies is Isra alensis. I might be saying that incorrectly. This is the one that's found in mosquito dunks that I mentioned earlier. And then beyond that, we also have um, spinosad products. These are another type of um, bacterial larvicide. So I want to take you through a few products that we have here that are kind of examples of things that I see homeowners use a little bit more. And so I wanted to kind of give you a closer lens into those. The first one would be mosquito dunks. Like I mentioned, these are Bacillus thuringiensis based um, pesticides and specifically they are that bacterial larvicide so they're going to be placed into a body of water where there might be standing water and they will go ahead and that bacteria will kill the larva of mosquitoes. 
Um, in terms of, you know, it's, I'd say, you know, effectiveness, um, it is kind of advertised to be relatively non-toxic to bees, but it can um, affect the larva of some other insects. And again, I am not a toxicologist, so we're not really going to get into that, but that's just sort of how it is advertised. One thing that I've been seeing more often that I think is very interesting is the use of more 25B products in the commercial sphere. So if let's say your neighbor was to call a mosquito applicator and say, you know, hey, I really want the more natural version of a mosquito application. This is a product that they would most likely use. This is called Essentia IC3. And you can notice here that the active ingredients are mainly just going to be essential oils of other plants. So we have rosemary oil, um, geranol, which is sort of the extract of geraniums, and then um, peppermint oil as well. Um, a lot of times these will be put out as if they were a normal liquid pesticide application, so they're going to be used in a fogger, and these kind of have more of that contact effect as well. Um, one thing that I thought was really interesting, I went over to a friend's house and she was hanging out at her brother's. They're definitely more kind of nature conscious, and they had actually run drip lines along their sort of back porch that they were spraying out cedar oil through as mosquito control. Um, I couldn't really speak to the effectiveness of that, unfortunately, but um, I will say that I thought it was very interesting and it's kind of similarly um, used similar to the, this product that we have up on screen right now. Um, the other thing is, again, it is advertised to be a little bit safer towards humans, pets, and areas of high traffic. And again, you know, that is just sort of um, how it is advertised. I can't speak to the actual safeness of the product. Um, you will notice here that it says 25B. Um, what this is, it means that the pesticide is exempt from normal pesticide registration. So there's a list of approved ingredients um, that the EPA has approved as sort of 25B products. So they're exempt from registration as a pesticide on a federal level. We do still require that those products are registered within our state. So uh, North Carolina does kind of have the consumers back there, I guess you could say, because we do still want to know that those pr products are registered and, you know, we know what the product is, but that's kind of what a 25B product is. This is going to be sort of the last product that we have a bit of a spotlight on. So this is Bifen IT. Um, the active ingredient here is Bifenthrin. When I was out in the field, I would say that this is probably one of the most commonly used ins insecticides that I saw, not only for the mosquito application industry, but also in the golf course industry as well. So it's very commonly used. It is a broad spectrum pyrethroid, um, like we spoke about previously. And a lot of times this is again applied kind of as a residual spray. So it'll stay around and they advertise it as up to three months but it really depends, of course, on the area where it is applied, um, if there's any rain that happens right after the application takes place, and that type of thing as well. The way that these pyrethroids work is by disrupting the nervous system of the insect, ultimately causing a weakened state of that insect and then leading to death. Like I mentioned, we're not going to get too much into mode of action, but because this one is more commonly used, I thought I would throw it out there for you. This is the Bifen IT um, label. So you'll notice here that we have our active ingredient. We are going to get into um, a li little bit more in terms of labels here, but um, right here um, you'll see on the pesticide that that label is right in on the very front of that product container. So that's the place to find the label. The first thing that you want to do if you'd like to know what exactly that pesticide is, is look at that active ingredient. Most of the time with bifenthrin products, they are almost or always 7.9% active ingredient. I'm not really sure why, but they almost always seem to be. And then beyond that, the other thing that I have highlighted here is that signal word. Like I mentioned earlier, this denotes toxicity. I'm going to show you a chart here in a little bit as well. But just know for this one, um, we do have a caution signal word. B 
Beyond that, you'll notice that below the active ingredient on the left side, we do have the EPA registration number. Again, this will um, kind of tell you what the chemical is formulated specifically as. So this is specifically Bifen IT. Like I mentioned earlier, there are a ton of different products that have the same exact active ingredient. So it's always good to specify if somebody tells you, you know, hey, this is what was sprayed at, at the house ask them for an EPA registration number because that's how we're going to know what label corresponds with that product. The other thing here that you'll notice is that within the precautionary statements, it does mention that the product is um, harmful if swallowed, inhaled, or absorbed through the skin, so on sort of a human health capacity you know, segment. And then additionally, in our environmental hazards, it is noted that the product is not only harmful to fish and aquatic invertebrates, but also that it is highly toxic to bees. And I've kind of put that statement similar to what we saw in our bee advisory box up here in the corner. So it says this product is highly toxic to bees exposed directly to treatment or residues on blooming crops or weeds. Do not apply this product or allow to drift onto blooming crops if bees are visiting the treatment area. So like I mentioned earlier, from a regulatory standpoint, everything that is stated on this label, so that do not apply this product to blooming crops, that is kind of a rule to the applicator. So if they apply this product to an area where there is blooming flowers, that is a violation of the law. And that's kind of how we derive some of our violations is from the label. Again, we're going to go over that here in just a little bit too. This kind of brings up me to my next point. So like I had mentioned to you, I am not a toxicologist. However, we did just hire a toxicologist for our department. Her name is Beth Dittman, and yesterday was actually her first day. So um, in terms of any questions that you might have about mosquito products or toxicity, I'm going to ask that you send them to my email. Um, that way I can kind of filter them over to her. On the left side of this um, slide, you'll notice that I put down our signal words. So like I mentioned earlier, these will generally denote the overall toxicity of that pesticide. What we looked at earlier with our mosquito dunks, our essentia, and also the bifenthrin, all of them have a caution signal word. So this is going to be in terms of, you know, our overall scale on more of the less toxic end. This doesn't mean that they are non-toxic, it just means that compared to other pesticides, they are on the lower end of the scale. Beyond that, we have warning, danger, and danger poison. Um, other places that you can go if, let's say, you ever wanted to talk to somebody about toxicity, apart from directly contacting the toxicologist with our department, you can always kind of give the National Pesticide Information Center or NPIC a call. They are an incredible resource. They have great information on their website about different types of pesticides, and they do also just take general questions. I've added their website here as well as their phone number. One thing that we have up on our own website for the Department of Agriculture that's pretty cool, if I do say so myself, is this uh, chart that's called Pesticide Toxicity to Bees Traffic Light. And the traffic light was made by our old toxicologist before he moved on to work with the EPA. And what this does is actually a guide based off of active ingredient about how toxic the pesticide active ingredient is to bees. So similar to a traffic light, our super toxic pesticides are going to be in red. We also have our sort of um, medium kind of yellow um, active ingredients. And then beyond that, we have our relatively kind of non-toxic pesticide active ingredients in green. I went through and I kind of pulled out some that were going to be a little bit more um, topical, I guess you'd say, to mosquito applications. So going through some of these with you here, bifenthrin that we talked about earlier, and it does list the agricultural um, trade names or the commercial trade names of these products as well, which can be very helpful. You'll notice that bifenthrin is a highly toxic insecticide to bees. We also have imidacloprid, which is again one that we had mentioned earlier when we were looking at specific active ingredients um, used for mosquito applications. Again, 
more on the highly toxic end of the scale. Um, Lindane is a product that's used um, or previously was used in Christmas tree farms um, and is not used for mosquito applications. One thing that is really interesting though, I'll kind of tell you a side story. I went out to do a um, routine inspection at a non-licensed retail outlet or a hardware store when I was still out in the field and I went in there and I noticed that um, the man behind the desk looked like he hadn't sold any pesticides in a very long time. He did tell me he was 86, um, which I thought was pretty cool. And he was selling Lindane in the back. It was just sitting up there on the shelf. Um, Lindane has absolutely been pulled from the commercial market. I asked him when the last time he sold one of those was, and he said uh, probably about 20 years ago. I did come back later and actually dispose of the Lindane for him because I felt that kind of to be my duty since of course he can't be selling those now. Um, so that's just kind of a funny side story. Occasionally we'd find some very old pesticides while out in the field and very glad to kind of have them off of the commercial market now. Beyond that, um, we have malathion, which we spoke about earlier is highly toxic, paramethrin, or, um, and then also our pyrethrins are again, highly toxic to bees. We um, have pyrethrins and piperinyl butoxide. You might see piperinyl butoxide on a um, pesticide label. This isn't actually a pesticide. It's actually it's almost more of an additive. It's credited as making pesticide active ingredients a little bit more effective, which is very interesting, but they'll list it in the active ingredient category. Um, and then we also have spinosad, which we talked about. Um, one thing to point out with the spinosad, even though this is one of those bacterial larvicides and it is really only supposed to target the larva of um, you know, mosquito species, I guess you'd say, um, when they advertise it, do not be fooled. It can also negatively affect the larva of bees as well. So this would be one versus Bacillus thuringiensis that would probably be kind of a no-no. Some of the other kind of uh, commonly used just sort of herbicides, I do get a lot of questions about these, so I wanted to throw these up here as well. Dicamba and Paraquat dichloride are moderately toxic to bees. Um, please make a note here that just because it's moderately toxic to bees does not mean that it's moderately toxic to humans. For example, Paraquat dichloride is a um, danger poison signal word. It is very toxic. Um, so just kind of make a note of that too. One thing that I always like to remind people is that if you are going to be applying a pesticide that's targeting a pest insect that has a similar biological function to a beneficial insect, it might negatively affect them as well. Um, beyond that, we do have a list here of relatively non-toxic um, products to um, one that we can point out here is Bacillus thuringiensis. That one we talked a little bit about earlier as well. And that's again, one of those bacterial larvicides. So you might be wondering, between our two divisions, who actually regulates the use of mosquito products? And the answer to that question is actually both. So we get kind of a double dip. We have applicators who have a structural pest control license within the P phase, which is sort of our household pest control phase, um, that are able to apply for mosquitoes around a structure through their structural certification. And then in sort of the pesticide section, which is the one that I work for, um, through our licensing and certification, we have a public health category. So these are individuals who are licensed to apply for mosquitoes for the sake of public health, uh, quote unquote that are able to apply to mosquitoes broadly outdoors, but not up against a structure. Um, one thing that I do also like to note here as well is that no licensing is required, of course, by just our homeowners or renters. Um, if it is a general use pesticide, anybody can go ahead as it is with any pesticide to make an application to their own product, um, property without being licensed. So for example, I could go out to Home Depot and buy some Roundup and apply it to my property. Um, I will make a, on a personal note, I, I don't apply any pesticides myself. I get a little bit of, of enough of them at work, so I don't, don't do any of that outside of work. But um, beyond that, I did get a question specifically about, you know, how exactly do you actually regulate mosquito companies? So I made this chart. The chart is a little bit confusing, so follow me here. We're going to start over on the left side. 
there are two ways in which we identify pesticide violations or potential pesticide violations. We'll start down at the bottom at routine inspections because it's a little bit easier to follow. So let's say one of our pesticide inspectors is out in the field and they notice that somebody who is applying for mosquitoes is not wearing the right PPE. So they're wearing shorts, they're wearing sandals, which you know we definitely don't want them to be doing. They will go ahead and issue what's known as a notice of non-compliance. From that point, they will allow them 30 days or a specified amount of time to get into compliance. If let's say they do not get into compliance, then we will go ahead and turn that notice of non-compliance into an investigation. So you'll kind of follow that chart up there and you'll see that it points to investigation. If let's say, you know, our inspector continues to monitor them over the next 30 days, they've seen them out in the field multiple times and they know that they are in fact wearing the personal protective equipment that they need to be wearing, then the issue will be resolved. They will issue a reinspection that clears out the initial notice of non-compliance. From there, since we've kind of covered that bottom routine inspection section, we're going to move up to the top of this chart, which is where my job comes in. So let's say, you know, I'm here in the office and I get a complaint call from somebody. Hey, uh, so and so just came out and they sent an applicator to my house to make an application for mosquitoes and I did not hire anybody. They applied to the wrong property. At that point, what we will do is either issue one of our inspectors to check out the situation as either a citizen's inquiry, which is basically kind of the lower level where we just want to get a little bit more information, what's going on. If we find out in that citizen's inquiry that a violation was committed, we will go ahead and elevate that complaint to an investigation. If let's say we know right off the bat, for example, in this um, sort of scenario I gave you where they applied to the wrong property, well, we definitely know that they committed a violation. So we're just going to go ahead and make that an investigation straight away. So you'll see here on this chart that I have any time there is a pesticide violation, it goes right to investigation. From there, our inspector will go out, they'll interview the individual that made the complaint, we call them our complainant, they'll take some photos, they'll ask them what happened, they'll write many copious notes, and then they'll compile those photos and those notes, and sometimes if they take samples as well, into an investigation report. That investigation report once completed and those samples have been submitted, once they come back, the sample results and we get that investigation report in the office, our district supervisors, as well as the deputy of our department, myself, and then also our attorney and paralegal will work through the case and decide what type of violations were actually committed based off of the regulations for North Carolina. So you'll see here we go from our investigation report to our violations assigned, and these are assigned through the drawing up of a settlement agreement. I would say about 99% of our cases are settled through a settlement agreement. What this is, is a document that says, hey, you know, you violated the law and for that reason, we would like to take this action. So if let's say, you know, there is a scenario where we know that they violated the law, they could receive a fine from us. Their license could also be suspended or revoked. And then from there, if they agree to that settlement agreement amount, then we will go ahead and send it over to our pesticide board. The pesticide board is seven individuals appointed by the governor that are all from the agricultural industry or are associated with the agricultural industry. Um, we do also have one member that is sort of a member at large who kind of exists as sort of our NGO or non-government organization, probably a conservation organization. Um, and they will go ahead and review the settlements. We actually had a pesticide board meeting today, so we reviewed um, and approved nine settlements today, so that was interesting. Um, but they'll go ahead and kind of look over the settlement agreement. If let's say they decide that they think that the fine or the license suspension, something like that looks correct, then they will go ahead and approve it, thereby sort of resolving the issue. Um, we do have, as we call them, uh, frequent flyers. So these are individuals who violate the law multiple times. So there are people who look at multiple investigations throughout the year if they continue to violate the law. 
if let's say they violate the law to such extent that we need to, we will go ahead and revoke their license entirely so they will no longer be able to apply pesticides at all. Occasionally we get folks who just say, you know, hey, I'm not cool with the settlement agreement and we will go ahead and have a formal hearing with the pesticide board in which they can go in front of the pesticide board and kind of talk about their case. This doesn't happen very often. It's pretty occasional. Um, there are scenarios um, because you might be wondering, well, what if let's say somebody doesn't work in the pest control industry? What if they're just a homeowner and they drifted onto their neighbor's property or something like that? We do issue what's known as a notice of warning, which basically identifies the violations that they may have committed and said, hey, please don't do that again. And that's kind of determined on a case by case basis, as all of our cases are. In terms of our common um, violations related to mosquito applications, we have quite a few. This is sort of a, a kind of list of things that I see very commonly that have come across my desk since I started this job. So um, like I mentioned earlier, occasionally we do have mosquito applicators who are very careless and they will actually apply to the wrong property. This has happened multiple times. A lot of times it's newer employees that are going based off of a GPS system that kind of failed them a little bit. Um, beyond that, we do have quite a few cases in which applicators will apply pesticides to blooming flower forage right next to a beehive causing a bee kill. Um, you would be surprised that um, luckily we don't actually have that many bee kills that are related to pesticides within the state. I almost wish I would have uh, put that table up here instead of the number of mosquito complaints that we get because that would also be a very interesting table to check out. Um, beyond that, we do have drift of that mosquito applications to another property. I will say that's fairly easy to do because of the manner in which um, mosquito applicators actually apply with the fogger. Like we talked about, that ultra low volume spray it disperses it into a fog and can kind of go everywhere. So we do see this happen fairly commonly. Beyond that, we have applications made in high winds. Sometimes, like we looked at earlier with the pesticide label, it will say on that pesticide label in the sort of application rules, it'll say, do not apply in wind speeds higher than 10 miles per hour or something like that. So we can go back and check weather data. If in fact they were applying in really high wind speeds, then they violated the law. Beyond that, um, we do have applications in which the application actually contacted an individual. Of course, we really don't like when this happens. Um, I had one last year in which um, the application was made and it went through a hedge fence into the neighbor's backyard and contacted a child. That's something that we really don't like to see happen, of course, but it does happen occasionally. And then, of course, there is also times where the applicator is just not wearing personal protective equipment, so they're putting themselves at risk for exposure, but they're also violating the label. Oh, almost forgot, so sorry. Um, in terms of the complaints that we received, I went through and I tallied all of the mosquito complaints that we have received formally over this last sort of five or six years. So in 2015, we received three complaints related to mosquitoes, so not very many. 2016, we had 10 formal complaints, 17, eight formal complaints, 2018, 12 formal complaints, 2019, 10 formal complaints, 2020, eight formal complaints. And then for this year so far, we only have three. I would say we're probably going to be somewhere around eight or 10 by the end of this year, just based off of kind of looking at these last numbers. And in total, I think it was about 43 complaints in total. So, um, this part, I will say, I apologize, is not very exciting. Of course, we don't really want to be looking at regulatory code all the time. Um, if you were wondering where specifically the regulations, or excuse me, the violations come from within our regulations, this is some regulatory code that you can look at. If there was somebody who sprayed blooming flower forage, this comes from our miscellaneous prohibited acts section. So it shall be unlawful for any person to use a pesticide in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. We've talked about this a few times now, so you kind of know that the label is the law and that it is basically something that pesticide applicators have to follow to a T. 
Beyond that, if let's say somebody applied to the wrong property, um, this would be under denial, suspension and revocation of a license. Um, specifically, it's operated in a faulty, careless or negligent manner. You might be wondering who decides what is faulty, careless or negligent. That would again be sort of the internal discussion individuals that go through and look at every case. So it's our supervisors and also our attorneys at the Department of Justice. Finally, we have pesticide drift, which I would say is probably one of our most common, if not that sort of um, applying other than what the label states. This would probably be the um, most common type of violations that we have. And you'll see that we can also apply that, you know, a person is using a pesticide in a manner inconsistent with its labeling here. And then we do have a drift control violation um, written into our regulations, and that specifically is going to be in those regulations for food and drug. It's um, 1404, but um, no person shall apply pesticides under such conditions that drift from pesticides, particles or vapors result in adverse effect. The key here is adverse effect. Um, if we do not see adverse effect, then it is kind of a situation where we have to consider the case. But a lot of times with our drift cases, we will see adverse effect. This kind of brings me into our sort of last slide segment, which is so common myths and facts that I occasionally hear. I get the pesticide applicators cannot spray for mosquitoes in the daytime told to me constantly over the phone. Unfortunately, this is a myth. Um, they are able to spray in the daytime. Most of our applicators work a normal nine to five job as we all do. The thing to remember here is that um, despite the fact that you know they are applying pesticides, they are hired to perform a service by the individual that hired them. So in this case, it would be making a mosquito application. Um, and again, it is kind of their normal nine to five job. Um, I will kind of echo what I stated earlier, which is that our department exists sort of as an unbiased middle ground to regulate the industry. So we are there not only on behalf of homeowners and civilians, but also on behalf of farmers and people in the pesticide industry. So we really are kind of in the middle, just trying to get compliance. Beyond that, um, I do hear very often, um, I've told the applicator that I have bees, why haven't they stopped spraying? It's the same type of a situation as what we talked about just before in this last one that you know, if let's say they're licensed to be applying and they're applying based off of the pesticide label, they are out there hired to perform a service. Um, in these types of scenarios, we certainly encourage you to, um, if you have bees, feel free to go and speak with them and let them know they might change their management decision. This happens sometimes. They might not though. And in that case, you know, it's always good to contact our department so that we can kind of, you know, go through and see what was applied, see if they applied it correctly and these types of things, because our department really is here for you as a kind of civilian in this so that you can get more information. Um, I do hear often um, some things about the right of way. The utility companies cannot spray the right of way. That's my property. One thing to note with this, and this of course is not really specific to mosquito applications. I just threw this one in here because I hear about it really often. Um, the utility company is allocated, if it is a normal power line, 15 feet on either side of the power line, so a total of 30 feet of that right of way to manage the area as they see fit. Um, I always like to mention to individuals, especially if you're a home gardener and you are tending to your own garden near that area, you are able to get on a no spray list. So that's something you can contact the energy company directly or power company directly so that you can get on that no spray list. I know that's kind of an option too. A few other myths and facts. Um, my bees are on field watch, so they can't spray near my house slash notification is mandatory. Um, we did touch on field watch a little bit earlier in the presentation. This is again that kind of mapping system where individuals can mark down where their beehives are. Just because the bees are on this system does not mean that they need to notify you. It's voluntary on both of the um, beekeepers and the applicators perspectives. 
that being said, if let's say you are a beekeeper and you want to be notified, we do have mandatory notification for aerial applicators. So those who are applying by helicopter or by airplane, if you register your bees with the state, if this is something that you would like to do, it's about $10 a month through our plant industry division. Um, please let me know, I can certainly help you do that. I will say though, um, a lot of applicators, especially for mosquito control companies, do look at FieldWatch. So I know that they're kind of out there taking a look at it, even though it's not mandatory, they are there looking at it because of course they want to avoid any type of liability or damaging somebody's beehives. Um, Another one I see often is, you know, they're applying pesticides. It's a very windy day, so they have to stop. Um, this we talked about earlier too. It's based off of the statement on the label. So if there is a statement on the label that says you cannot apply over 10 miles per hour or what have you based off of that specific label, then that could be a violation or it could not. It's kind of case by case. Um, they sprayed my property without my permission. That is illegal. Indeed it is. So that is a fact. If they sprayed your property, if it's overspray, if it's drift, if they got the house mixed up and you did not hire them there to do that, that is illegal. 100% um, call our department, talk to us about it. It's always good to call as early as possible. So even that same day, if you can, and I will put our direct line phone number up on the screen here in just a minute as well. Beyond that, um, we have, again, we're kind of coming back to our pesticide applicators cannot spray blooming flower forage slash flowers. So fact, they cannot. There is a statement on almost every single label that is harmful to bees that they cannot spray blooming flower forage. This is again kind of based off of a label statement, but almost all that I have seen do have this statement built in. So again, this is kind of a fact versus a myth. So at this point, you might be wondering, well, what do I do if I see a possible violation? Um, the first thing to remember is, you know, we want you to be safe in your home. I frequently get calls hearing the horror stories of people who ran out to try to speak with a pesticide applicator and it got really ugly. And, you know, of course, now they know where you live. So that is not what we want. If you think there is a violation, we don't want you to get into an argument, of course, so please call our department. We are here to be a middleman for you to kind of do all of the dirty, ugly work of, you know, kind of if it comes to it, regulating that applicator, but also just getting basic information for people about what was applied and those types of things. You can, of course, take a photo if you see something happening. Um, I would say try to keep this discreet again because we do have applicators who will get upset and they'll kind of come at you and that is not what we want of course but if let's say you see somebody applying without personal protective equipment or you see them you know applying to blooming flowers certainly take a photo that really helps us with the investigation process although it is not necessary so don't feel pressured to take one if you aren't able to and if let's say you do have bees and you see that there is a mosquito application happening near you um you know, make a note of these first two, you know, avoid confrontation, take a picture if you can, but also go ahead and contact our department immediately. We can go ahead and get an apiary inspector as well as a pesticide inspector out there to short, sort of uh, alleviate the situation and see if we can, you know, either stop that application if it's very close to the bees or if they're drifting onto your property or, you know, kind of speak with them about being care more careful in the future. And, you know, in general, if you do have any questions or if you just see something that you think might be a violation or looks really fishy, you can absolutely call our department and we are very happy to take those calls from you. Um, I have both our office number up here, which is that 733 number, and then I also have my personal direct line, which is that 857 number. And this pretty much concludes um, the presentation. I hope that it was informative and you got kind of that brief overview. Um, I also thought this comic was very funny, so I went ahead and put it up here. Um, it's all of sort of the dead bugs that have been killed by pesticides going to bug heaven. And um, here is my information. I will go ahead and uh, stop sharing my screen once you've had the opportunity to write this down and then we can get into some questions. I think that's probably okay. <laughs> 
All right, let me see. OK, and I should have stopped sharing now. Awesome. I think that Donna was going to start with some of the questions. If you want to unmute yourself, Donna. Sorry. Perfect. Um, we do have some questions. Um, the first one is uh, my neighbor had commercial applicator spray his lawn. I asked to see the label. It had lemongrass oil, geraniol, castor oil, cedarwood oil, sodium laurel sulfate, and corn oil. Will this kill the pollinators? So it sounds like that product is one of those products that I had mentioned earlier, which is known as a 25B product. A lot of times these are formulated specifically as a bit on the more safer or kind of softer side, I guess, of pesticides in terms of their active ingredients. Um, unfortunately, I am going to have to kind of defer you to our toxicologists because since I work in enforcement, I cannot talk about toxicology. And also I will say as a disclaimer, I just don't have the educational background there, so you really don't want me to answer those questions for you because, yeah, I can, I can give you the sort of from the, the enforcement lens, but yeah, we can certainly follow up on that question in the future. Okay, and then um, someone else wants to know how many people are in your department to manage all these pesticides and, and um, pesticide, apply, pesticide appliers. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say that we probably have about 50 people in our office, I would say, and this covers everything from licensing and certification to pesticide registration to enforcement. Um, and we also have, of course, those 18 individuals out in the field as well. So I would say maybe in total we have about 60 or 70 people within our department, but this is a ballpark that could be more or less. I'm not really sure. So with 18 inspectors, how many sites do they have to cover? Yeah, great question. Um, generally, our inspector ones will cover about six to nine counties. It really depends on where they are in the state. Um, they are out in pickup trucks from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. every single day performing routine and random inspections. I know for myself, I think that the first year that I was out in the field and I had about six counties, I think I did close to about like 1500 inspections. Wow. So yeah, it was a good amount and all of our inspectors are highly productive and they go everywhere from the Home Depot or the supermarket all the way over to the big farm or the nursery or, you know, landscape applicators. It is kind of funny. Um, the the joke that all of my friends had for me that was that we were pesticide police because I would actually roll up there in the car and present a badge. Um, it was funny because sometimes I would just wave to people and they didn't think that I was a pesticide inspector, so they would come up to me, which was very hilarious. But um, you know, ultimately we'd be regulating them, so maybe not so funny for them, right? Okay. Um then someone wants to know if there's a uh, non mosquito friendly bird bath. Oh my goodness. Um, so one thing that I know a lot of people do is use those mosquito dunks. Um, so that is kind of an option because, you know, and this is something again we can speak to a toxicologist about if we have specific questions, but um, that Bacillus thuringiensis shouldn't be necessarily harmful to birds, but that's really the only thing I know is using those bacterial larvicides. Um, I also want to make a disclaimer here that is not a recommendation. Since we're a regulatory agency, I cannot recommend pesticides to you. So, you know, don't take it as a recommendation, okay. just sort of an idea, I guess. All right. Well, I'll pipe in with that one. And what I would say to this to control mosquitoes in your bird bath is change your water every three days. And, you know, or you can put something in there if you have a little, a little bubbler or a fountain, you know, something that moves the water, they won't lay their eggs. They won't lay their eggs in that. So mostly it's keeping it, keeping it clean, keeping the water fresh. Well, um, we'll help with that anyway. Okay, but this is my program. Um, Let's see, is the Accentria product safe for pollinators? I guess that's another toxicology question. 
Yeah, and, um, certainly go ahead and take a look at our um, pesticide toxicity to bees traffic light. Um, that would be a good one. It does specify on there geranol and rosemary oil. And actually, I can go ahead and pop that into the chat. That way um, it can be used there. It might take me a minute to find it, but I'll be sure to put that in the chat for you too. Okay, then someone commented that it's amazing the state has just hired a toxicologist and what did we do before that? So we always have a toxicologist on staff. You may have heard me mention that our previous toxicologists went and work for the EPA. Occasionally the EPA will poach our employees, um, but I will say, you know, we're very happy to have um, Beth Dittman, who is our new toxicologist in the office. During that lapse period, um, I was fielding all of the toxicology calls. And if there was a question that I could not answer, because again, I don't have that background, I would send it over to the Department of Health and Human Services who has toxicologists on staff. So there's never a lapse in a toxicologist, just so you know. We're, we're not leaving anyone hanging there. Okay, and I, I think we sort of covered this in um, how drift is determined and, and the wind speed. Mm -hmm. um, but, but one question is, is that does that standard apply for both the homeowner and for commercial application? So in terms of drift, I would say yes. Um, really any drift onto anybody else's property, this would apply. So it doesn't matter if you are a homeowner who's drifted onto another homeowner's property or a commercial applicator who's drifted onto a homeowner's property or even a commercial applicator drifting onto another commercial property. We do have homeowners drift onto farmers, farmers drift onto homeowners. So really any site you can imagine that drift regulation applies. Okay, and can you comment on the garlic based commercial application? Ooh, um, in terms of I, I mean, in terms of its efficacy, I really don't know too much. I haven't heard too much about that one. Um, I think if there were a specific product and you wouldn't mind emailing me, I could certainly do some research and find out a little bit more. Um, I've heard about people using garlic, but it's much more in kind of the homeowner sphere, not really the commercial sphere. So I don't know of any products that use garlic off of the top of my head. Okay, then um, someone comment that the glyphosate based herbicides can be toxic to larval amphibians, um, that um, they had a neighbor that killed most of her toads and frogs, which is sad. Um, so that would be a product like Roundup. Yeah, glyphosate is the active ingredient of Roundup and many, many products that people use. Um, I assume that as we continue to go on, because it is a very well-known pesticide, we're going to continue to get more investigation into how that product affects um, not only weeds, but also other species. So I would expect much more information coming out about that as people continue to research. Okay. Um, and we already talked about the most common types of violations. Um, what is the time frame, usual time frame for the issue for the um, issue to be resolved? And is there an average fine? Yeah, great question. So um, in terms of contact with the complainant, who again is that person who makes that complaint, um, we have them contacted by the inspector within 24 hours of when the complaint is placed. So we have an incredible turnaround time with them kind of setting up a time to meet and speak with them about their complaint. In terms of, you know, sort of what is stated in our standard operating procedures, the investigation needs to be completed within 10 days of when it was initiated. I will say that this really depends um, on the case. Sometimes they could be done in one day. Sometimes they could be um, done in, you know, 12 days. It really just depends on how much information is available. Um, in terms of a sort of standard fine, so maybe the best way for me to explain this is explain our penalty matrix. So we have a penalty matrix which is derived from um, previous settlement agreements that were approved by the board and our attorney at Department of Justice will go through with our field staff supervisors and using the matrix they will assign a fine value to every violation. 
So one violation could be 200 or $500, but a lot of times, and this is just a random number, that's not the actual amounts that they are. It depends again on that penalty matrix, but one individual could have violated, you know, up to however many violations occurred. So it could be that one person within that investigation has eight violations and each time they get hit with that fine of two hundred dollars so it could be something as low as five hundred dollars or two hundred dollars all the way up to four or five thousand dollars um also the fines that come from our investigations and settlements do not come back to our department they actually all of the monetary settlements go back to the school district for the public school district in the county in which the complaint was filed okay and so that's even if it was a homeowner's complaint mm -hmm. so the, yeah. the homeowner doesn't doesn't get any compensation no nope, there are no we don't do anything for um compensation okay um let me see um, one of the questions, and this is related to what I had, um, does forage apply to the plant and flower leaves? This is a very common bird, such as the house fence, each house finch eats non-flowering leaves quite commonly. And how does that mesh with residential spring? And, and my mm -hmm. kind of along with that, as I was wondering about, it seems like the focus is on whether there's danger to honeybees. Mm -hmm. but there are other pollinators like the butterflies you know so if they if they see you know butterflies or you know and then there are some nectar eating birds you know if they see those types of animals are they prohibited from spraying or is it just honeybees so in terms of our regulations from that standpoint um it's based off of the label statement, not based off of the presence of pollinators or you know, beneficial species. So if let's say there is a statement on the label that says they cannot apply to blooming flower forage and they're applying there, even if there are no beneficial species there, they still have a violation. Um, I would say because of the nature, no pun intended, of our kind of regulations being focused right now around honeybees i would say a lot of them are geared towards them but this is kind of the first step on a pathway i would say to mm -hmm. continuing to you know kind of get more proficient in the way that we regulate and because a lot of public focus is focused around honeybees i would say that's probably kind of why we're there but um you know, in terms of leaves and non-flowering portions of the plant, to my knowledge right now, there aren't really any statements like that because that's generally what they are applying to. Um, specifically with mosquitoes, a lot of mosquitoes will kind of hang out in that vegetation and so they are directly applying to the leaves. I guess that's kind of uh, in the interest of who is actually trying to make the application, you know. Okay. Um could I just jump in a sec? Wouldn't um, the word forage cover the leaves? You would think so, but it's really dependent upon, it'll normally say flower forage, but okay. you know, I certainly agree with you. I think it does cover that, you know, especially from the standpoint of, you know, Audubon or somebody is considering birds. I definitely agree with you. And that's kind of what I meant with sort of, we're in the step of the right direction with right. bees. It's Hopefully we'll see more of that in the future, but you know, it's it's hard to say right now because we're only moving at a, the pace we're moving, which seems to be sometimes glacial. So I do I do apologize, but that's kind of just the way it is currently. So how how do we go about getting something like that added to a label? Oof, um, added to a label would be tricky. Um, is that would have to be through the EPA? It would be through the EPA or actually through the chemical manufacturer. But I do also want to make a note here that any pesticide related complaints or suggestions that are received oftentimes come to our office, even if they're received through the EPA, because they will defer to sort of on the ground action with our inspectors. Mm -hmm. um, to make a change to a label, most likely you would have to contact the manufacturer 
And I would say that you would probably have to have a reasonable amount of scientific discovery backing up your point. So that that's kind of where I think you would need to go, but it's fairly uncommon, I would say, for changes to the label to be made unless there is a, a real threat to human health or animal health that has um, appeared. So an example of this, we recently, um, I'm not sure if this is widely spread knowledge. There were a few articles posted about it on a national basis, but Soresto collars recently were banned because they were causing secondary contamination from animals to their owners um, and also just causing general, you know, very bad pesticide poisoning incidents with animals. Um, from there, we derive, you know, new regulations, new kind of attitudes around that specific product. So, you know, similarly, we have new regulation for paraquat that happened within this last few years. That's a commonly used broad spectrum herbicide that's used for kind of burn down applications for pre-plant um, paraquat dichloride. They recently regulated it much more and actually created a closed system for all of the products that are being sold because of how many paraquat poisoning events were seen throughout our country each year. So yeah, in order to get uh, the EPA and manufacturers to notice, there kind of has to be big responses, I would say. Okay, well, great. We have one more question and then we're gonna wrap up. Um, and this kind of goes back to, to drift that without wind, what is, you know, is there an average distance of drift? Without wind, well, I guess wind is kind of the essential ingredient there for it yeah. to drift. Um, without wind, it would just be the amount that is propelled by the sprayer. Um, for mosquito foggers, based off of the setting that they put it on, I actually looked this up for somebody recently. Um, if let's say they were trying to apply at the highest pressure that they could, it can go like 30, 15 to 30 feet up into the air. And that's without wind. That's based off of the power of that spray fogging apparatus that they're using, the spray device. Um, but again, it's really dependent upon the type of application they're making. Of course, they're not going to propel it 30 feet through the bushes onto somebody else's property because they do not want drift um, because we will we will yeah. find them. But. Uh, can I kind of jump in because uh, my question is along those lines. Sure. Um, my neighbor has admitted to me that he has his land scrapers spraying Roundup on our fence line because he doesn't want my milkweed coming onto his property. Mm. I've seen it damaging milkweed as far as four feet away from the fence. Um, that, for one thing, I don't, his landscraper isn't wearing any PPE, but because it's Roundup, um, is that acceptable? So the Roundup label most of the time for glyphosate specifies that they need to be wearing long sleeves, long pants, shoes and socks, not gloves, but protective eyewear, which we don't normally see them wearing. If let's say you ever see them applying without PPE, snap a picture and send it to me and we will get somebody out there. Um, if the application is on his property, if it does not come onto your property, he can apply whatever he wants on his property or have that landscaper apply whatever he wants on his property as long as the landscaper is licensed and applying based off of the label, if that makes sense. Even but if though it, I know he's he's specifically aiming several feet onto my property. Oh, if he gets onto oh, your yeah. property, call us. We will send an inspector out there. That is a violation of the law. Okay, so even for a homeowner then? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And what I had mentioned earlier when we issue a notice of warning, normally those are issued to homeowners. It's kind of like, hey, the state is paying attention. Please do not do this again. If you do, then, you know, and that would be if the homeowner made the application. If a landscaper is making the application, abso absolutely. I mean, I don't even think we'd issue a notice of warning. It would probably just be, you know, a settlement agreement or some type of, a, you know, actionable 
violation. But again, it's very much based off of what our sort of discussion group decides. And that would not be me. I'm kind of more just a case manager. So. OK, and I have another comment that I wanted to throw into. Um, first off, people don't know about you guys. They don't know that they can call somebody. I had um, a year after I moved down here, True Green nuked my entire property killed tons of of um, plants that I brought down with me, a whole bunch of stuff. I didn't know better. They said tough that I should be grateful that they gave me a free treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and that was it. So it, it almost seems like maybe somehow if you guys, if you did more um, education about it, maybe even commercials or something so that A, people know, and that B, now the landscapers know they're being watched. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that would help. Um, furthermore, I just want to throw out for anybody who has pets, the condition with Ceresto, Spinosad it, and Amitocloprid, um, and a lot of the things that are in your spot on treatments that you put on cats and dogs for fleas and everything, those are full blown pesticides. They will kill your monarchs. If you go outside and you're applying it outside and back spray or anything gets on your plants, it will kill stuff. So I just a lot of people don't realize that I lost a bunch of monarchs to having that residue on my hands. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out too. that a lot of people don't realize that that truly is a pesticide. Yeah, I, I appreciate you bringing that up because I think that um, a lot of times the way that the culture around pesticides exists in America a lot of times we think that these products are very much safe if we're told to put them on our pets. You know, we view them more almost like medication, not a pesticide. And it can be really disheartening, of course, because we get calls from people who have accidentally poisoned their animals because they over applied. And that's why it's so important to read the label. That's my biggest take home from this presentation is read the pesticide label. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, this is kind of common sense, but people don't really think about it. You are applying that chemical to your animal transdermally. You also have skin. Please wear gloves while you are applying that chemical because otherwise you can also be affected by it as well. Or what you had said, um, Ms. Gruber, that it can, you know, kill your your plants. If you get it on your plants, it could kill pollinators. So that does and happen. On, and it's an oily residue. I was I was getting it on the handle of my door, and every time I came in and out to go get the milkweed, I was applying the oils to the milkweed, fed it to my mom, my, um, my caterpillars and killed a bunch of them. Um, so that's just something because a lot of, like you said, a lot of people don't realize that, well, if I can put it on my pet, it must be safe. No, it's still a pesticide. It's just not strong enough to kill your pet. And it's not aiming for mammals. It's aiming for insects, but it kills all insects. Almost none of this stuff is species specific except for the BT stuff. Yeah, well, thank, yeah thank you for your comments, Kristen. Um, we are going to go ahead and wrap up. Uh, Sydney's email is thank in you, Sydney. The, oh, sure thing. Uh, we've had lots of thank yous to you, Sydney, and we're happy that you could do this presentation to, as Kristen pointed out, get more of the word out. So thank you very much. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight and do keep up with us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We have a YouTube channel. Um, a lot, we will be having some things going on over the summer, all outdoors. So, um, and we will follow all the COVID guidelines for keeping everybody safe. So um, do check in with us. And also oh, I need to mention that we also have things posted on our website, charlottewildlife.org. So thank you and good night. Thank Thanks, you. Sydney. Appreciate Thanks. it.